Hi Year 12 and welcome to the first video this week. Uh, today I'm going to be looking at Tessa's journey to the Valley of the Great Derbies, amongst them Talbothes, where she'll be uh, staying with Dairyman Crick. And we're going to be looking out for images of Eden and biblical allusion. The section I'm looking at begins with Tess did not stop at Weatherbury. So I would give yourself a minute to find that page in your book. It's right at the beginning of chapter 16, which is XVI, the first chapter of phase the third, the rally. Okay, so give yourself a minute to find that, and then I'm going to take you through some of this imagery. So the first thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this word pilgrimage. A pilgrim, as you may or may not be aware, is on a dual journey. It's both physical and spiritual. Each phase of Tessa's life is marked by a journey which precipitates change. So it's interesting that Harley chooses the word pilgrimage and also that Tess is walking somewhere new. Look out for other journeys that Tess will make, which are going to define different phases in her life. The second thing I'd like you to have a look at is further down. You'll notice Tess is in the valley of the Great Dairies. So I've picked out, hopefully you can see this, but this section here. Um, and how it suggests Eden, which of course was the perfect, uh, perfect creation of God that Adam and Eve enjoyed in the story of Genesis. And it was a place of, of profusing growth, fertility. So I've just noted here, so we've got the Valley of the Great Dairies, Valley in which milk and butter grow to rankness, produced more profusely if less delicately than at her home, the verdant plain, which means richly green, so well watered by the river Var or Froom. The profuseness of growth and the plenty is reminiscent of Eden, but also of the promised land that God gives to his chosen people, the Israelites in the Bible. It too was a place of abundance flowing with in the in that story, milk and honey, here it's milk and butter. So Hardy is drawing our attention to the fact that this next place that Tess is journeying to is a place of plenty, a place of much. And we might also notice the scale of Tess, uh, Tess's new world. So I've picked out here, so we've got 50 acres instead of 10, farmsteads more extended, You've got tribes, not families, myriads of cows speckled thickly on the canvas. And that suggests that Tess is going to gain some anonymity, uh, also potentially greater freedom and room to grow. So the whole scale of this next part of the story is going to increase. There's certainly a lot of new characters, new developed characters, and, and there's a significant portion of the book spent at this dairy. We've also got a nice little cultural reference here, canvassed by Ausloot or Salert with burgers. Hardy alludes to some minor Flemish genre painters who favour painting busy scenes of rural life. Here, instead of people, here are the burgers, um, there are cows, as far as the eye can see. So the it, description there is just basically loads and loads of cows. Um, but also suggest something rural and idyllic. He's evoking images of an idealised version of, of a pastoral scene, which just means a scene set in the countryside. Next, I'd like to draw your attention to the description of the cows as well. So we've got white-coated animals returned to the eye in rays almost dazzling, even at the distant elevation on which you stood. And I know this is an odd thing, but I just want you to pick up on the, these places where Hardy is literally glorying in describing really ordinary rural scenes. Cows are dazzling, dazzlingly bright. Um, and there were some other descriptions that I put in your chapter notes, one where there's just loads of cows' backsides, <laughs> but he says that the way their shadow has been traced um, is as beautiful as like the, the, almost like the Elgin marbles um, and other treasures of ancient civilizations. And I think he is uh, assiduous in the way he's trying to place value on this way of life and of the beauty of what they're doing and of nature. Next, I'd like to draw your attention to some of these biblical allusions. Uh, ooh, actually, hold on. Before we go there, we've got the bird's eye perspective, and it's cheering. The new air was clear, bracing ethereal. Lots of you did really well picking out these points in the notes about 
I said, you know, what makes a seam edenic, uh, edenic? Ethereal means extremely delicate and light in a way that seems not of this world. And there's this real sense that the air she breathes there is lighter. And indeed, Tess emotionally feels lighter, less guilty most of the time at her time at Tabu phase. And uh, that seems to be in mirror image to the atmosphere setting. Um, and then we've got this lovely term of, ooh, oh, actually, it's come, yeah, no, this, this is one. So down here it says, um, her hopes mingled with the sunshine in an ideal photosphere which surrounded her as she bounded along against the soft south wind. And that's such an unusual word, photosphere. Turns out that Hardy's using both meanings. One is a really archaic term meaning a sphere of light. So you imagine Tess has almost got like a little halo around her, like she's the Madonna. Um, perfect Tess in her little dress, with a, usually a basket of stuff. Um, but we've also got this image of the luminous envelope of the sun or star from which its light and heat radiate. And it does say that um, her hopes mingled with the sunshine. So we've got this idea that Tess is both sunned upon and sunning the world, like she's glowing with light. Hardy evokes her immense vitality, spirit and zest. Look out for ways in which he talks about the way she's been illuminated. There's some lovely moments at dawn. Okay, so this next reference, the river of life shown to the evangelist. So the water in this valley is, is different from home. It's really pure. This reference is to Revelation 22, 1. John the evangelist, as opposed to John the Baptist, who's a different person. Uh, John's the writer of Revelation. He says he has a vision of a pure river of water of life, clear, clear as crystal. And this is part of the description of a new heaven and a new earth basically the eternal paradise that will replace this earth um, once the end time comes and in which everyone will live with God in an eternity of joy and pleasure. So that's suggesting again that there's something like paradisical about this place, the profuseness, the promised land imagery. Hardy is really intentional in his pointed use of biblical illusion. Um, interestingly, to suggest that Tess, a fallen woman and yet a pure woman, is entering a paradise. Hope, rebirth and renewal are natural. Condemnation, exclusion and death are man-made, we might surmise. Hardy certainly felt that hope, rebirth and renewal were reflected in many belief systems, but that condemnation, exclusion and death seem to come from um, an often hypocritical man-made um, idea about right and wrong and which carries a real heavy judgment and you'll see that in the man with the with the red paint pot interesting as well that he picks up on this um a uh, little little chant of um I think a, an old hymn uh, uh but he explains why she uses that down here there's some really unusual language here when i come across unusual language what i try and do is pop it apart and it's really dull I literally just look up each of the words and then try and piece it back together again. I'd encourage you to do the same thing when you come across difficult stuff in your chapter notes. So fetishistic has lots of meanings. I think the best that fits this instance of a fetishistic utterance is, is an excessive attachment or regard. You know, she loves that song. Um, she's done it uh, by repetition and uh, almost obsessively. And monotheistic refers to a religion that believes there's only one God. That's quite simple. But falsetto is, is a strange one. Is the voice is unusually high, often a male voice singing in a higher um higher note than their range naturally allows them. So if it was a male voice singing what up here, they would sound falsely like a woman. So it suggests something slightly not um natural. Uh, about the singing rhapsody i thought was also important because she says he says mm -hmm. uh, i completely lost it now rhapsody the unconscious rhapsody was a fetishistic utterance well a rhapsody is something that's really infused or ecstatic expression of feeling and he, he sort of implies that tess has these emotions and this is the only language she has to express them but that doesn't mean that that's exactly what she's feeling. In fact, 
when I put these together, um, and this reference to uh, women whose two companions are the forms and forces of outdoor nature retain in their souls far more of the pagan fantasy of the remote forefathers and of the systematised religion taught their race at a later date. Hardy is drawing attention to the fact that before Britain was Christian, it was pagan. And the fact that Christianity in Britain is a relatively recent invention, um, although obviously every religion claims to have ancient heritage in some way, and um, that there's something pagan about Tess because she's so close to nature, and paganism is um, pantheistic, like God is in nature. And um, he's suggesting that sort of she has been taught it, systematised and taught Christianity at a later date. So this not maybe her most natural expression of, of emotion. So if I put all that together, I surmise Tess sings a familiar and favourite song in a maybe high church singing voice, because we've got this um, monotheistic falsetto. So... Uh, maybe a bit like the choir at Kings, I don't know about you, but they have an amazingly churchy sound, uh, in praise of one God, not the many gods of paganism. And Hardy suggests that this is taught, learned, false and unnatural. So although Hardy suggests that she is entering an Eden-like state of uh, potentially rebirth, renewal and hope, and that she's entering into a promised land of sorts, that she is herself cannot be contained or expressed in um, within the discourse of contemporary Christianity as he knew it, um, that there was something more ancient and more connected to nature in Tess. I hope you enjoyed this and uh, look out for the questions on the next video.